I'm excited. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Uh, my goal is that we walk away with some practical knowledge. Um, and then it's kind of hard because it's strength and conditioning, which means it's very active. And I'm sitting in a chair currently at home. So I'm going to do my best to try to demonstrate and talk us through some things. So feel free to throw some questions um, as we get going, okay? And then I'm going to attempt to share my screen real quick. Yeah, so just real quick, they're going to, um, today, you guys, usually we just dive into the Q&A, but because Andrea has been kind enough to kind of put together a little presentation of some strength and conditioning stuff um, to get us started, um, she's going to kind of take the lead and walk us through some stuff. Um, and then at the end, we'll answer questions. But if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to pop them in there. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Andrea, take them away. Awesome, thanks, man. And just let me know if... Uh is working for us. Yep, looks good. Good, awesome. Let's see what we got there, cool, very cool. All right, so let's dive right in. So Lena kind of gave you a little uh, background on me, but I was gonna get going a little bit more depth and uh, any questions you have about background or anything I have, so please shoot my way. But, um, so I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm currently right here while we're all in quarantine, hanging out and hanging tight until MLB gives us that green light. Uh, to get going back again. I know we're all anxious to get back to baseball. I miss it terribly. Uh, but my education, I did my, uh, my undergrad around here at Missouri Baptist University in exercise science. Um, I interned a lot of really cool places throughout that in strength and conditioning. Um, and that led me to, to continue my education and get my master's in human performance at Lindenwood University, which is a, a local school again here in St. Louis. So um, throughout that, I did a lot of actually ice hockey. It was kind of something that I found a passion in as well. Um, so I worked with USA Hockey Development Camps that took me over to uh, work with the Chinese national team. So I went to China and worked with their hockey team as well. Um, and at Lindenwood, man, I worked with everything from synchronized swimming to volleyball, basketball, softball, baseball, golf, all of it. Um, and then just through networking and working as hard as I could to be the best at what I can do, I got an opportunity to be with the Twins. So I'm going into my second year at their big league level, which has been really, really great. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm excited to get back to baseball soon. Um, so this is just like a little view. Sometimes it's fun to see our weight room. Uh, it's only one side of it, so I wish I had some more pictures of it. But this is in, in Minnesota, um, and we're really fortunate to have some pretty cool facilities to, to work out in. So that's just a view for you guys. Um, and some of our goals for this. Uh, I know it's more Q&A, so I'll try to go through this fast. Um, but this is just an idea for you give some, some ideas for strength and conditioning. We need to learn how does conditioning play a role in baseball. Um, and then what are some different ideas for, for arm care? And then at the end of it, I hope you learn some things that you can take away and create your own strength and conditioning plan if you don't already have a coach or, or someone on your team that helps with that. And so I kind of have some caution with that. I obviously don't know you. I don't know your background. I don't know your previous injury history. I don't know um, where you currently stand. So these are just ideas. Uh, they're just things that maybe you can try to implement. And I always suggest that you either seek out a professional or um, you, you know somebody that can kind of help you and watch you and, and take you through these movements. So um, I'm open to questions if you have previous injuries, how we can modify or change things, but just know that overall these are just kind of a generic rule of thumb that we kind of do as well. So why does strength and conditioning matter? Um, we talk a lot about in, in baseball, all different levels, the, the movement quality, movement efficiency, movement capacity, all these kind of fancy words just mean the better we move and the more efficient we move with using less energy, uh, the longer we can stay on that field. And that's the, the goal at the end of the day, right? If, if I'm injured and I'm a great skilled player, but I can't get out there and play, uh, my skill kind of doesn't matter at that point. So my job um, at any level, at any sport, is trying to keep those players as healthy as possible. Because um, I want them to have a long career. Uh, I want them to be enjoying the sport that they love. And so that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we know baseball, you know, it's a strength and power sport. And so strength and conditioning, we really focus on that because we want to increase that performance even a 1% better even at the big leagues, these million dollar players, if I can get them 1% better, if I can increase their strength, if I can increase their power and keep them healthy, uh, maybe that increases you know, their longevity and playing a little bit longer or, or a better contract or, or what those things are looking for. And then it's injury reduction. We like to say we can't prevent injuries because they will happen, but can we reduce them? So if you're playing and you're rounding first and you accidentally roll your ankle, have we made that tissue, the tendons, the ligaments, the, the musculature around that so resilient that if that ankle was to roll, it would bounce right back and you'd be okay. Um, but sometimes when we don't use that strength training, we don't stress those tissues, there could be a chance that you roll and maybe you're sitting out for six weeks and that's what we don't want. And as a strength coach, that hurts my feelings and I don't want that to happen. So I want to make sure that we stay as healthy as possible. So that's why it matters. 
And then conditioning. I mean, we can go into really, really big depths of conditioning and energy system development. We can talk about the difference between aerobic and anaerobic capacity, sprint speed. Um, but conditioning is just useful. So I, we use that for a lot of things. Um, a big thing that we use it for at the big leagues is, is recovery um, in a flush. So when our starting pitchers come out, we'll put them on the bike for 10 minutes. Um, and then we use it a lot for, you know, position players when they come in and, and they're feeling pretty tired or exhausted. We'll we utilize a conditioning system, whether that's pushing a sled or, or sprints on the bike or um, running 10 yards or whatever it might be um, to help them, to get them really ready and feeling a little bit better. And so these are just some examples of what kind of conditioning we would use. So we call them cut fives. It's just setting up basically cones five yards apart and it's a down and a back. Uh, we might do 10 rounds of that with a good recovery in between. Um, 15 yard striders is again setting up cones 15 yards apart. We sprint down, you walk back. Uh, then we have like our 30 yards if we're opening it up a little bit more. We maybe do six of those. Sprint down, sprint back. And then maybe it's a 50 yard strider again, opening up a little bit more for maybe some more flush or more um, endurance type work. We'll do that. And then our classic like five, 10 fives for some agility. So we utilize all these. Um, we try to get creative because sometimes things get monotonous. So being as creative as possible and changing some things up. We might put a, a guy versus another guy, um, try to get some kind of competition going too. But um, for us too, like an off season, we're thinking about conditioning. We're trying to build a, a base, an aerobic base. Um, and when we have a really good aerobic base, it helps us with recovery. And so the goal too in the game is trying to recover as fast as you can and try to manage the best you can. Uh, one of my guys said to me at spring training, I asked him, you know, how are you feeling? Uh, and he kind of laughed at me and he said, the only day you feel good is the first day. And after that, it's just, you know, maintaining and trying to, trying to manage the game after you keep going. Um, and so the better their base is, the better they have this aerobic capacity, um, ability to go for longer periods of time, they're going to be able to recover better. And they'll be able to turn around the next day and uh, play the game and, and keep going. And like I said, in season, we might do some maintenance, making sure their sprint speed is up, um, make sure we address that. And then like a flush, making sure that they're recovered best we can too. So that's on the conditioning aspect. We can talk more and dive more into that too if we have questions. Uh, but I want to talk about arm care too. It's kind of a topic that has a lot of opinions. Um, and so my overall opinion is I think all types of training are arm care. We can utilize it anywhere. So if you like bands, if you like J bands, if you like um, Olympic lifting, like there's so many different variables that you can use for arm care. You just have to find what works for you and makes you feel better and makes it feel like you're working what you're supposed to. And so for me, I, I focus on three types of arm or three types of positions for our arm care. And that's what these are here. We have like our scap on rib or that shoulder blade. You know, how well does that shoulder blade move around the rib cage? Um, and then we have a ball and socket where you have that, that head of the humerus, our arm bone. And then we have this, this socket, this rotator cup on top of it. And so we need that ball to move really freely with inside that to allow us to increase our power, to keep us healthy, and to actually get to the position that we want to get into. And that third one is the rhythmic stability. So we want that rotator cuff on the backside too, to be able to grab onto that humerus and stabilize it. And we don't want it to be too out of control and or we don't want to activate something else to take over for it. We're actually not using that, that correct position that we should be in. So these are just some kind of examples. I'm, a, I'm visual, so I think that looking at some exercises that help with that arm care is helpful. So this is one of them is our scap on rib. How well does that that scap or that shoulder blade move around the rib cage. And so this one is called a prone trap raise we use. Um, so there, oh, sorry. So we kind of put ourselves in that neutral position. There'll be a side view in a second. Um, and we're really just trying to get that scap or that shoulder blade to anterior tilt or flip back. And you can see it right here. And his arm, he's trying to rotate that arm a little bit. And so, you know, if he's feeling good and can get into that position, we might put a two, three, four, five pounds in his hand and try to get him into that position while maintaining a really good scat position. And then we have another one here. Oh, that's our ball and socket, sorry. Let's go back. Sorry, scap on rib. So this was exactly the same one we just saw here. It's just an, an abducted position, which just means it's a little bit outside of our body. So that first one's more like in a Y position. And this next one over here would be more of like a T if you're looking at that. So you can kind of see that O on his back. It's tilting towards his spine. And that's a really good scap position. That's what we want it to do. Sometimes that scap gets stuck right on the ribs and just that arm is what's working. And that scap is actually not moving around the rib cage. And that's when we know we kind of have a problem there. So our next one's that ball and socket. So these are a couple exercises. 
We call this a supine external rotation. You should be laying on your back, putting, he has a half of a foam roller underneath his elbow. You just kind of elevate it a little bit. And his goal is to keep that shoulder steady and rotate that hand towards the ground without letting the front of that arm come forward. So I know it sounds confusing, but you're just trying to rotate. And if you put your hand on your shoulder right now and you rotate it like this, you'll feel that ball in that socket moving in congruence together, hopefully. And you're not using that trap, that upper arm to use it, but actually moving through that scap, you'll feel that. And so that's probably our, our start. Andrea. Yes, ma'am. You've got some amazing, uh, um, some amazing information here. Um, my question is, since a lot of our girls are, are younger and like uh, the example of a five pound weight, what would mm -hmm. be the best kind of weight for, um, you know, high school kids and so on to use? Sure. And I think sometimes too, it's a great question. Uh, age and ability sometimes takes a back seat to like that weight. So we have some guys that honestly, I wouldn't even put a five pound dumbbell. They're professional players. I wouldn't even put weight in their hand because they haven't mastered that movement. So I'm not against just literally body weight or just that arm movement and just getting through ranges of motion. So that's that movement capacity and movement quality we're looking for. Um, and once they've mastered that, yeah, can you put a two pound dumbbell at, even at a high school level or high school female, like should, could we be able to do that and own that position and not just go through the motions or let the wrong things activate at that time? Does that answer? Yeah. So what I hear you saying is that maximum is not always the right thing to do. Right. Correct movement and strengthening those, those small areas. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of a uh, what we call like old school thought is like more is always better and heavier is always better and faster is always better. Um, and the reality is like quality controlled movements that go through all ranges of motion that hit on our weaknesses, that would trump someone deadlifting 250 pounds to me. Um, that you can move efficiently using as less energy so we can save our energy for big plays and a long game that you would make sure that you, you would try to hopefully pick movement quality over everything else. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So this is somewhere you're gonna grab a partner on this one. Um, and same thing, we're trying to get that ball and socket to move well together. And so he just has a partner, he's like, as he was on the ground before, someone's gonna stabilize his elbow, and he's just trying to use that arm and rotate back without the front of his shoulder popping up. That's easy, that's typically what happens as we rotate back, that front of the shoulder wants to pop up, and then we're not using actually our, our rotator cuff very well. And then the last one, is our rhythmic stability. So we want that member, that cuff to hang on to it and activate it. And so these are just kind of like, sometimes they're really hard and they're kind of awkward at first, but this will be like a two position. And while he's in this really good position, which is his throwing, so he's holding this kind of foam ball and he's throwing it like in this position against the wall and he's gonna stay right there. And his partner over here is actually like perturbating, moving that arm pretty quickly and letting that cuff kind of stabilize the position. So it's kind of hard to see this, but he's moving his hands. The guy that's um, his partner is moving his hands across his shoulder and his bicep and trying to get him to stabilize his arm in that position. And then we'll go to the three positions. Same thing. We'll have a partner here. And the three positions. The first one's just vertical straight up. And that partner is just slowly moving it. Then he has his arm slot, that second position. Same thing. Can you stabilize that? Can you use that? And then he'll go in what we call like a 90-90 position. So three positions, he'll maybe do that for five seconds and actually make that cuff really work. And if you're doing it correctly, it'll wear you out pretty good. So that's some of the arm care ideas. And then for the rest of it, I'll just kind of go quickly through it. And you guys can resort back to this. I think Lena can, can give it to you, the presentation. But just some videos of exercises that we can do. I, what I think is really unique about uh, the time we're in right now is that Hopefully gyms are starting to open, but right now we're all in the same field. Like I have major league players that have to utilize milk jugs and backpacks just same as an eight-year-old would have to if they're stuck at home as well. And so we're kind of on this playing field, but at the same time, what's the basics is the basics across the board. So no matter what level you're playing at, like if you can master these basic body weight movements, um, it just seems that like, can we do movement well, not necessarily maximum? but doing it well really, really matters no matter what level you're playing at. And so these are some ideas we use. We actually presented this to our guys. Um, and so here's some ideas of like utilizing your couch and a backpack and a paper plate and some canned goods to utilize some external load for your movements. 
Um, and then here we go, it's just some body weight uh, exercises you guys can utilize at home. We have our players, this is part of our database for our guys to use. Um, this is just a yoga push-up. So it's just a variation of a push-up. Um, so at the top, you see that he'll drive his head towards his feet, stretching that his lats. You'll feel if you have tight hammies, you'll feel it through that, trying to keep your legs straight. So we might implement like three sets of 10 or three sets of eight, depending where they're at. We use it for our warm up a lot. Um, and then dead bugs, it's like for our anterior core. So some core work we'll use for our guys. It's a little bit challenging, a little coordinating, but trying to keep that low back pressed against the ground. You'll alternate your hands. You'll really feel that in your core. Um, this is a big activation for us too before guys go out to the field and play. And then strength coaches, we like to use abbreviations a lot. So this stands for a rear foot elevated split squat, RFE. And so you're just really focusing on keeping that, that core tight. You have a little bit of a forward lean and that foot is elevated. So like for me at home, I'm doing these and I'm using my couch um, or the ottoman um, or anything I can find to have my felt foot back foot elevated. That's good single leg movement there. And then we call this a prone bridge single leg extension, just like a fancy version of a plank. So holding that plank position, alternating your legs and trying to keep that core as stable as possible. Here, this guy struggling a little bit to keep it steady, uh, but trying to keep his stiffness, working on anterior core. We call this a lateral hide and stick. Just a plyometric uh, progression that we use. It's in a frontal plane. So drive that foot and we add a stick into it. We might progress them first to doing um, uh, a stick for a certain amount of time. Then we progress it to a continuous, so left to right to left and continue it to. Uh, I might continue to three movement back and forth with the rest in between. Uh, there's a lot of like fun things you can be creative with it too. So I think last, uh, last slide I have too is just modification. So with all different abilities, there's just different ways you can take those five exercises and make them harder, more advanced, or even a little bit easier. So we can do that through like an assistance or resistance. So you can add a little bit more weight to your backpack if it's too light. Um, or you can get someone to help you and assist you through a movement, something to push on if you're doing that rear foot and it's hard. Maybe there's something in front of you, a bench that you can push up against that'll help you. Uh, and then rest time, longer or shorter rest periods would change the intensity of the workout and the movements and maybe make it harder or easier. So if it's this week we work on just doing 45 seconds between exercises, maybe the next week is 30 seconds and you kind of decrease that rest time. Um, and then changing the volume, so the reps, reps and sets. This week, maybe you're focused on just going three rounds of everything. And the next week, can we add four, can we add five, um, and make some changes through that. And then fancy word, but change the levers, change the position, the body position will make it harder or easier. So for example, like a push-up, when you're on your knees, it's a little bit easier, that's the lever is shorter. And then maybe you go hands elevated, which makes it even easier. And then maybe you go feet elevated, which actually makes it even harder. So changing the body position, changing those levers, will make it either harder or easier. So same with a step up, like a lower box or a higher box. Um, and then like our glute bridges, you can move your feet away or closer. And then like a dead bug, only move in maybe one hand or, or just your arms or just your legs. So I know that I attached some more videos um, to the backside for you guys to look through. I won't waste your time to go through them all. Um, but I challenge you to use them and try them out. Like I said, like our, our guys use these all the time. And though they seem basic in body weight, uh, they can be advanced and challenging if you do them correctly and, and accurately. That was awesome. Thanks so much, Andrea. And I know um, that was a lot for everyone to digest. <laughs> and we don't expect you to memorize all this. So we will be putting these up on our website um, later that um, for you guys to kind of use so you can warm up and you can um, use them to work out at home. Um, but with that, I think we will, I know that people have a lot of questions. So We'll just kind of dive into the questions if you're okay with that, Andrea. Absolutely, please. Um, and again, some of these will be strength and condition specific, and some of them will be just for for you and about you. Um, but I think we'll we'll start off with a question from Kate, who is from Southern California. Kate, go ahead. Hi, my name's Kate. I'm 13 from Southern California. Uh, what stretches and drills should pitchers do before and after outings? Good question, Kate. Thank you. Um, so our pitchers are sometimes we treat them like like they're uh, breakable, right? But I think that our pitchers and position players are, are pretty pretty tough. Um, and so I think that's pretty equal across the board. So if you're not a pitcher, this still applies to you. Um, but I think as far as like our, our warm up and what we're doing, we always want to make sure that first we get that heart rate up. So we typically call it like a dynamic warm up. It's a fancy word for just saying 
moving through stretches. So instead of this static stretch or holding a position, we're gonna try to move through a position. Um, and so if that's like our classic quad stretch where you grab at the back of that leg and stretch your quad, you might walk, take a couple steps in between each. I'm sure you've done a dynamic warm up at some point. So that's a really good one. And honestly, at the same time, for recovery when you're coming off the mound, it's the same thing. Going through a dynamic, what we call warm up or a cool down and going through that ranges of motion and stretching it through that. Uh, like I said, too, in that, that little presentation, doing some kind of flush or bike ride, I'm um, going for an easy jog right after just to kind of come down from where you are. is also a really good way to end your outing too. Thank you. Good question. Good question. Um, kind of a follow-up question to that is from Hannah, who's from Arizona. Hannah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Hannah and I'm 13 years old and I'm wondering how many days a week do you think we should take off from conditioning or working out? Yeah, good question. Uh, so I think you have to figure out what works for you and your schedule. And I think it changes when you're playing games uh, or you're practicing. Um, and so typically we tell like, it's like our pitchers, we tell them to try to lift twice a week and we condition at least one or two times on top of that. Um, and so maybe that looks like four days a week split up. Sometimes they lift and condition on the same day, which is good too. So you kind of figure out what your schedule works. I also encourage like at this age when we can do a lot of different things, like um, going out for runs or playing other sports or playing soccer or something in between can really be great conditioning too. And so I always encourage like just playing and staying active really honestly helps more than anything. Um, and so if I'd say like if you want to follow a strict rule, like twice a week of good conditioning and then two to three times of some type of strength training. And whether you do that on the same days uh, or it's five days a week spread up, conditioning day, lifting day, conditioning day, it's kind of up to you and your schedule too. Thank you. Good question. And just a reminder, you guys, I know that Kate and um, Hannah just did, but just remind um, Andrea or tell Andrea how old you are so that she can kind of tailor her um, responses to you. Um, the next question is a little bit different. It's going to be coming from Leah. Um, Leah, go ahead. Um, 13. What, what does MLB look for in their coaches? Good question. And what do you mean? Do you mean like strength coaches like me, position coaches or managers? What kind of coach? Strength coaches, like strength and conditioning, like what you do. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, I was really fortunate to, to really rely on my network to get to the position I am. And so I would encourage anyone, it's, it's about your character and who you are first and making sure that you build good relationships that will help you in the long run. And at the same time, you help them out, too. So my position kind of was really fortunate that I would know somebody that knew the director with the twins. And then through a phone call, I got that opportunity. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like if you can really know why you do what you do. And so I obviously love the weight room. I love conditioning. I love all aspects of physical things, but more than anything, I, I love those players and I really love helping and I want to help people. Um, I want to help everyone in my clubhouse too. So not just, the players, but also um, our kitchen guys, our equipment guys, or our front office, and, and helping them too. So I think that when applying for jobs or looking for things, I think that character always trumps skill first, because I think you can always learn, uh, learn how to do the job and, and get some great education and, and experience and internships is really important too. But I really think that developing your character, developing your why, uh, it kind of, it, that matters to me more than anything. And I think that's what a lot of places would look for. Someone that puts a team first, puts um, what they want and what they think second to what is better for the whole team. Thank you. Good question, Leah. Um, the next question is going to be coming from Olivia, who is from Oregon. Go ahead, Olivia. Hey, um, I'm 16, and my question was, what is a, like, whether it's a mentality or, like, a trick to get past to the point of exhaustion or, like, pain when you're working out? Sure, good question. Um, so I think that pain is always an indicator to stop, <laughs> no matter what. Um, and so I think that uh, you've got to really know the difference between what we would maybe say like lazy and pain. Um, and so if, it, if you're in pain for something that you're doing, I'd recommend maybe you, you get that look pat or whatever that, that problem may be. But um, I, I always just challenge people like to, to really put things in perspective. And so sometimes I can remember playing the, playing the game and like thinking I was just going to die. Like I could not do 10 sprints. Um, but if I really put that in perspective, I probably could pump out eight, nine, and ten my reps. Um, and so I think you just got to tap into to why you're there and what you want out of it uh, and know the benefit and value of it. So sometimes I'm not perfect all the time and I'll be lazy and not want to do a workout. 
And then I got to remember my goals. I got to remember why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want to be an example. I want to be the best at what I do. And so maybe that'll activate something inside of me to uh, push through and maybe do it. But I think that that is a mentality. It's an intrinsic motivation. It's something inside of you. It's tapping into why you do what you do. Um, and so for me, like I, I'll remind myself of my why. Um, I have it written down. I'll look at it. I'll remember my goals that I'll set. And that kind of helps motivate me to keep going. Too. Good question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Olivia. Um, we have another question from another Olivia from New York. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Olivia. Hi, I'm Olivia and I'm 16 years old. So my question is, how important is flexibility when you play baseball? Cool, Olivia, are you driving right now? Um, well, the meeting started while I'm while I was in my car on my way back home from a practice, so I just decided to stay in my car. <laughs> I appreciate that. The sun reflecting and everything. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, so when think about flexibility, we kind of think about it in two different types. So we have flexibility, and we have what we call like mobility. So flexibility is kind of just like do those muscles move. Uh, through ranges of motion and then mobility like do they move in joints like can your shoulder joint move in all ranges of motion and so both are important but I would prioritize mobility more than flexibility um, because that matters to me being able to move those joints and move my body in different segments to making sure it works really well and efficiently um, but I would say it's really important um, I think it could help prevent a lot of injuries that maybe pop up because of tightness through ranges of motion tightness in muscles um, and so I really recommend taking time and finding a good routine that you can, you can challenge yourself and push yourself to, to stay flexible and mobile. Um, but I would see it as very, very important. I think you can see a lot of guys too and, and girls when they play, it's, it's their warmups take them through a lot of ranges of motion. And that's the benefit of like a dynamic warm up. Like I said, it's taking your body, getting your heart rate up, taking your body through all ranges of motion um, to help yourself move better, move more efficiently and to reduce that injury too. So I would put it as quite important. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Good questions, you guys. Um, the next one's gonna be coming from Gianna from California. Go ahead, Gianna. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm 11, and I was wondering um, what areas of the body you train, um, like specifically for baseball, um, because some other sports, um, train one specific area of your body, um, but do you know what um, area you train for baseball? Yeah, it's a good question. I like that. Uh, I would say the total body. Um, I know sometimes you put emphasis on like arm care or um, just, just different things that maybe pertain to baseball, but I would say overall making sure that the whole body moves and functions really, really well. So I don't know if I put emphasis on one thing more than the other. I think as females too, we have a tendency to maybe be a little bit um, on a little bit on the weaker side. So I'd always encourage like weight training and getting, getting strong uh, as you continue to age and get older. Cause I think that's a huge benefit. So training total body, we have our guys go through total body. Um, every, every twice, one day or two, it's total body. Um, some guys like a split where they maybe do an upper body one day and a lower body the next day. Uh, but I think that when it comes to baseball and our sport, making sure we train the entire body to function together and all ranges of motion. Good question. Thank you. Our next question is going to be coming from Sophie from Maryland. Go ahead, Sophie. Hey, um, I'm Sophie. I'm 15. Um, I was wondering, we talked about this earlier in your presentation about arm care, but what exercises or like Jager band exercises would you recommend specifically for increasing velocity? Yeah, big words. I like that, Sophie. Good question. Um, so it, it's really going to depend on your high needs. And so I, the best thing I can do is try to encourage to get some kind of a professional assessment done where you know what your high needs are, um, which I know is not ideal sometimes at certain points. But um, velocity definitely comes from a total body approach, too. So I think we just rely on our arm to produce any type of velo will probably be more prone to injury. And so the total body strength is so important. Um, I'm not against J-bands. That's just a philosophy that some people have stronger than others. Uh, and for me, sometimes I have a hard time seeing people do J-bands and they're doing them just through, just to do one, right? They're just kind of pumping out like 15 reps of them. 
And sometimes it doesn't activate what we want in that shoulder blade, that scap, that humeral head. Sometimes it doesn't activate that. And sometimes we get real trap dominant um, or we use our lats or we use our shoulder instead of actually using that good rotator cuff. So I'd encourage you that the, the videos I showed you, try them out too, maybe mix them in with your J-bands. Um, but I do think VLO, if we're really thinking about VLO, it comes from a total body approach from the ground up. So making sure that we have a really good, we call it kinetic sequencing. Like do we, does every aspect of our body sequence in the appropriate way to produce that power, to produce that speed? Does our pelvis rotate the, and then our, our upper body torso and then our elbow comes through and then our wrist and do we have that through? So that comes, I think, I'm a big believer, right, in the weight room. So I think that comes from overall really, really good strength too. Um, and then not, not, definitely not taking out the arm care because that's important to maintain and make sure we're on there. Does that answer it? Yeah, thank you. Cool. We're gonna have the next one come from Meredith from Florida. Go ahead, Meredith. Oh, and Mary, if you're talking right now, hang on. Um, I think you're on mute. Hi, I'm Meredith. I'm 12 years old. Um, during these times, how much conditioning and training would you recommend a week without overdoing it or doing too little? Good question, Mary. I think if I can encourage anything too, is to make sure that you know your body. And so being really mindful of what you feel, uh, how you feel, how you wake up, the soreness level that you feel. Uh, I would even encourage you to track it, to keep a journal. So if you did some strength training yesterday, wake up on a scale of one to 10, you know, how do you feel? Are you tired? Are you exhausted? And so being really aware and watching some patterns. Um, and so I think that overtraining is something that does happen. But for me, I think we're also a lot of times under recovered. And that's kind of just like a fancy word to say, like we don't spend enough time stretching. Uh, we don't spend enough time uh, warming up, cooling down and doing a lot of those things that would prevent some of that overtraining. Um, some of that soreness. And so I, I really would encourage you to journal and write down how you feel every day, what's your body like. Maybe there's a day you wake up and you feel great and you can push it a little harder in the weight room or your conditioning. Maybe you wake up pretty tired. Uh, and then you got to know I got to take it a little easier, not do too many sprints. Maybe I lower the volume. Maybe I just do, you know, five instead of my 10. I uh, really listen to what your body says. And uh, that will help, I think, prevent some of that, that overtraining aspect too. Great questions, you guys. Um, we've got kind of a follow-up question to your presentation that you did from Arden, who is from California. Arden, go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, mentioned um, is I don't have much equipment at my house, but um, I do want to try and stay fit and, you know, keep exercising. So do you have any exercises you would recommend to stay fit during these times? Yeah, absolutely. Me too. I'm only stuck with like a 10 pound dumbbell right now. And so I'm kind of getting antsy, ready to get back to the weight room too. Um, but like I showed you in the, that, that presentation, all those require no equipment. So all the exercises are just body weight and that they're really powerful. And I think sometimes we think body weight's just too easy or we're above it. Uh, and I think that if we really utilize it correctly, you'll realize how challenging it is and it'll help with that fitness level uh, and staying strong, especially this time when we're kind of sitting around a lot. Um, I would also challenge you to, to get outside as much as possible. Um, I don't know if you have a, like a Fitbit or Apple Watch or some kind of pedometer that tracks steps. We try to hit like 10 to 15,000 steps every day. So staying active, moving, that's going to play a big role uh, into our overall fitness too, even though it sounds silly to go for a walk. Walks are pretty powerful. Um, and so I'd really encourage you to stay active, stay moving. And then that one slide I had too showed a lot of things that maybe you have at home that you could use instead of instead of weight. And then I would challenge you to get real creative, find things around your house that you could use instead, um, and then uh, go from there and add some some weight to a backpack. Find something you can load up with water, um, and just try to get as creative as possible because we're kind of all in the same boat right now. Good question. Thank you. Thanks, Arden. Um, the next one's going to come from Elsa, who's from Southern California. Um, Elsa, go ahead. I'm 11. My question was, how old should you be to start weights? Good question, Elsa. Hey, I won't hold it against you that you're in a Dodgers hat, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I like the Dodgers. Too. Um, so I think that you have to really be uh, aware, and that's why I encourage that, that disclaimer where I said maybe try to find a professional that can help you. Um, there's a bunch of research that's kind of mixed about what age females can start weight training. Um, but I always encourage body weight. 
And so I think there's nothing wrong with doing any type of body weight and you will gain strength. It's not just an easy thing to do. It really can be challenging. So I think going through correct movement patterns, I feel like a seven, eight, nine year old can easily start doing those things and then progressing. So as you get better at it, you know, add a little, we call it external load. So add a little bit more, maybe you're holding five pound dumbbells while you do your rear foot elevated squats or um, just, just different things you can try to, to maybe make it a little harder. But I think there's some mixed, mixed literature about when you can start, but I think you can always start with body weight, correct movement patterns, and then build off of that. Okay, thank you. Good question. Uh, the next one's gonna come from Ella, who is from Hawaii. Ella? You're up. Hi, um, my name is Ella. I'm 13. I'm from Hawaii. And my question is, how do you motivate your players to condition or just motivate them just to play? Very good question. I'm jealous of Hawaii. I'm in Missouri. It's not as fun. But uh, motivation at this level, at the big league level too, they're pretty motivated, right? They got here because they worked their butt off to get to this level. And so yeah. that intrinsic, that self-motivation, it's, it's for sure there between different guys. Um, and so that makes my job obviously a lot easier to kind of get alongside of them and help them. Um, a lot of guys kind of have their established routine. And so, again, my job is just to get next to them. How can I help them and, and maybe add a couple things that they didn't think of? Or I can maybe correct a couple things that they're doing. Um, but they're yeah. pretty motivated, which makes my job, like I said, fun when they show up in there. It also helps when you're winning, right? A team that wins seems to be a little bit more motivated. And it's a little bit more fun to be in the clubhouse and be around them. But I think it's hard when, when you're not winning, right? When the morale's a little bit down. And so again, I always like, what's your why? Why did you start playing the game? What is, what is maybe an accountability partner or someone that you know that could help you if you're feeling a little down or discouraged? Um, but I think in the day, like go back outside and just play catch. Like, to me, that always helps too. Like sometimes I'll get in my head, I might go shoot some hoops. I might be outside. I might, might play a little bit of catch or something that helps me kind of clear my mind, kind of remember my why, why I'm doing it. And it makes me want to get back out there. Thank you. Cool. Um, the next question is uh, going to come from actually uh, from one of the team at USA, the women's national team and co-CrossFit owner and probably the strongest woman that I personally know uh, from Tamara Holmes. Go ahead, Tamara. Hey, uh, hi. Thanks for having me. Um, just a quick question. Not that I discredit any of the basics. Um, I, I certainly agree and like what you said uh, about body weight and things of that, that nature. But I just had a question. A lot of times the programs that we've been sent over the years, it really looks like not a lot has changed. So I was just wondering, in your opinion, has a lot changed in strength and conditioning in regards to baseball over the years? Or has it largely just been the same? And if it has been the same, do you think that uh, there should be some changes? That's a great question. Really good question. So I can just be as transparent as possible and say I'm only going to my second year of baseball. Uh, I grew up a softball player. I'm like a third generation softball player. So I've been in the, in the game and the elements of it too. But as far as baseball, I'm still pretty, pretty new to it. Uh, but being that way and coming in with kind of a fresh mindset, um, coming from like a college private sector mindset too, I, I honestly was pretty shocked at like the, the old school way that baseball was kind of functioning. Um, and I kind of took this job and felt like I was in over my head at times. And when I first like said, yes, I'm going to jump into this. Um, and then getting there and realizing, wow, like, we have a lot of things to do to make up for it. I think strength and conditioning in general is a, like an ever evolving field. And there's constantly new things coming, new technology, um, new, new ways to utilize that. And I think we're getting better. I truly do. Um, but I think it comes down to the coach. And I think if you look at like um, across the board of strength coaches and you look at like the age discrepancies between you have some older guys that have been around as a strength coach for 25 plus years. And then some like myself and my director have been around for two or three years. Uh, I think you'll find that like there's like a newer school push, uh, which I think is going to be really refreshing. And not that the old school is wrong, because I do think basics, like you said, too, are, are basics and they need to be, to be mastered before we advance. Uh, but I do think that a new wave is coming through, which I'm excited about. And I want to be a part of that wave of better assessments, better technology to utilize. Can we understand what the, the internal load, the stress of the game, the travel, um, all the things that do play into our performance? What can we do to better manage that through the weight room? How can we promote recovery, better sleep, better nutrition? Um, so I think there's a lot of room to grow. I don't think we're there by any means yet, but I do think it's headed that way. Um, 
and I can speak for like, um, the twins, like we're definitely interested in that. And like, we want that to happen. Um, and so I think it just takes the right people and open-mindedness, setting our egos aside and being open to new, which I think sometimes is hard too. Um, so for me, I want to be a part of that, that cutting edge. I want to be part of that, that new wave that really advances and promotes better recovery, better performance, and how can we can help our players better. Thank you. Thanks, Tamara. Um, we've got another question here coming from Maggie, who is from New Hampshire. Go ahead, Maggie. Hi, I'm Maggie Fox. I'm 14 from New Hampshire. Um, I run a lot and I do a bunch of lower body, but what um, training, like for speed, would be helpful, especially for running bases? Yeah, very good. I think that um, in order to be good at something, we just have to keep doing it. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but I would just encourage you to run and continue that running, continue that speed. Um, in that slide too, I showed you some different variations of how you could implement conditioning. And so I think that if you're looking for some speed, we want to stay like on that, that, that lower distance. So I would encourage like no more than like 30 yards of running um, and not to like run for miles or run poles, but really think about quick bursts with adequate recovery in between. So like the one of them is like called like a strider where you sprint down 30 yards and walk back slowly. By the time we walk back, hopefully we're recovering that heart rate has dropped down. We can take off again. And so we're really working on those quick bursts. Um, those cut fives are really good too, where you just sprint five, turn around, sprint five back. And maybe it only take you like two or three strides, maybe four strides to get to that five, five yards, but really working on that. So for me, the, the, how we get better is just practicing and doing it. Um, I do think strength plays a huge role in our speed. So the stronger we are, the stronger our foundation is, the quicker we can be. Um, so we do need that base of strength first, and then we can kind of transition that strength into like a power more focused. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Um, the next question is going to be coming from uh, a player named Miriam, and she is from Chicago. Miriam, go ahead. Hi, I'm Miriam, and my question is, why did you switch to working with men instead of women? Say that first part again. Cool. I was distracted by your cool hat. <laughs> Why did you switch to working with men instead of women? Well, I hope someday we have a professional women's team and that can just transition back over to that. Um, but I saw a really good opportunity. Um, I worked at the college level with men and women's sports. Um, I obviously like working with girls a little bit better. They're a little bit more fun for me for sure. Uh, but this was a good opportunity and, and fortunately there wasn't a woman there yet. And so I saw an opportunity to jump on that and hopefully it could help pave the way and be a part of more women being involved. Um, but I definitely have a special place for, for training female athletes above everything. Um, but men which is a really good opportunity to try to help um, and maybe bridge some gaps for us too. Good question. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam. Way to represent the, the home team there, or kind of. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, we got another question here from Ophelia, who's from San Francisco. Ophelia? Uh, I'm Ophelia, and I'm from San Francisco, and I'm on the Bay Sox. Um, my question is, uh, wait, um, did you ever second guess you? If so, what did you do to, like, keep on going? That's a good question. I probably have second guessed myself more than trusted myself anything in life. Um, and I think that's just kind of human nature to doubt yourself and maybe be a little insecure. Um, but something I've learned in life and continue to grow in is a, a motto that I use a lot. It's courage over comfort. And so courage just meaning uh, picking the things that are scary, picking the things that maybe make you uncomfortable or nervous and choosing to do those things more than it's nice to be comfortable and stay at home. Um, and so there's been a lot of times I've second guessed myself or doubted myself. Uh, but I think when you just choose the attitude that I'm going to do it no matter what, I'm going to work my butt off. I'm going to try my hardest, and I won't let myself fail. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to rely on my good people around me to, to support me and help me, and I'm going to really think about my why and what I do and then choosing that. So for me, uh, I have an anchor, and that's my faith, and sometimes when I doubt myself or I'm insecure, I really rely on that, um, and I remind myself of my identity and who I am, 
Um, and that often triggers some power inside of myself that helps me continue to move forward. And so I think it's okay to doubt yourself or, or feel nervous or insecure, um, but I would challenge you to do it anyway um, and see what happens. And I think you surprise yourself. I think a lot of times we hold ourselves back because we're scared we're gonna fail. Um, but we always say failing is just falling forward and we're gonna continue moving forward. Even if I, even I mess up, even if I fall flat on my face, I'm gonna learn from it, I'm gonna pick myself back up and I'm gonna keep moving forward. It's a good question. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, we've got another, I imagine another Bay Sox player um, named Amalia. Mm -hmm. um, Amalia, go ahead and ask your question. Um, I'm Amalia Lopez. I am 10 years old, going on 11, and I'm from San Francisco, California. Um, my question is, um, I know that there's different types of bodies, more flexible than others, and more um, maybe stronger and bigger than others. Um, I am, I think, neither. Um, I am definitely not flexible at all. But um, is there like one part that like almost like all bodies share that can, um, that counts as flexibility that like, um, it, it's in the category of flexibility that we all have that could be put to use. That's a good question. And you're right, we're all different, right? If you look up my big league lineup, all those guys, not one of them is the same. And if I showed you uh, like a movement assessment, if I did like a, a pre-test on them and showed you, not one is the same. Um, and so that's the unique part of my job is to figure out how to take all these different bodies and abilities and flexibilities and figure out how to help them and make them better. Um, so the, the short answer is like, no, or there's nothing that's similar between me and you and Justine and Lena, we're all different. And we all move differently and our capacities for movement are different, our skills are different, um, but it's figuring out where are some holes or weaknesses within your movement, within your flexibility that we can improve. And sometimes those little improvements make a huge difference. And so trying to find out what are those holes, how can we fix those, what we can add to it, because I can't come in and just overhaul and change everything about you. That might actually not help you. That might actually might make you not as skilled as you are. And so it's even for my guys, I can't come in and try to change all these things on them, even if they don't functionally move how textbook says for them to move. I need to get alongside them, figure out what are some things we can address and change, and hopefully that will help. So you got to know yourself. You got to know, like you, you said pretty honestly, I'm not most flexible. So let's work on that. What can we do to change that? And let's see if it actually applies to the field and you see if you get a little bit more skilled or, or work a little bit better with some of your technique with, with increased flexibility. I appreciate your honesty. Thanks for your question. Um, the next question is going to be coming from Josephine, who's from New York as well. Not as well, um, but she is from New York. Joe, go ahead. I'm Josephine. Um, I'm 15 uh, from New York City. Um, and I was just wondering, are there, um, what foods or things outside of working out? I know you're a strength and conditioning coach, but I was wondering if you had um, advice on types of foods you can eat, habits you can have, or maybe when you work out um, to uh, maximize your muscle progress and optimize the strength workouts? Yeah, that's a good question. We could talk for hours probably about that topic because that's pretty, pretty in depth, but just like a, a quick generic thing. Um, us females, we typically don't have a lot of protein in our diets, just made it's not drawn towards that. So I always in, encourage you to, to add some type of a protein. Um, and I always look at like whole foods first. So instead of like supplements and powders and all those things, like, can you get it from just your daily food intake. Um, and so can you make sure you have a little bit extra chicken for dinner? Um, or maybe it's a protein bar that you feel at 15, you feel comfortable to have some of those things. Um, I would say like having some, a good amount of like carbohydrates before activity is a great way to make sure that we have a good fuel to our muscles and then protein afterwards. Um, if you want to get really, really in depth, like nutrition, you need a, a protein and a carb source at the end of any extreme activity. So after a game, after a hard practice, making sure you have a carb and a protein that carbohydrate will facilitate that protein to actually work. And so just taking like a straight protein shake or straight something that doesn't have a carbohydrate as like a, a 
car to take that protein to, to its next stop is kind of what you need. Um, but I would say, like, I know it's not as fun and, and, and glamorous, but like fruits and vegetables really do matter. Um, and to make sure you have adequate that, good whole grains, like our oatmeals, um, good pastas, those things are gonna really help fuel, fuel you. And then it also help with them some recovery and hopefully some muscle growth too. Good question, Joe. Um, I've actually got a question from one of our coaches. Um, Hondo, I don't know if you're still on. Um, are you still there, Hondra? If not, I can ask the question for you. I'm, I'm here. I just, I'm having some in and out. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the question for him. Um, he, he's one of the coaches of the San Francisco Bay Sox here. Um, and he coaches girls as young as seven or eight um, through ages 13, 14. And so he's wondering how often should younger players begin to exercise and strength train? And are there some specific exercises that are best for young um, women in baseball? Yeah, good, good question. I, I think it always goes back to um, don't put it like, – age doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, like the weight room are all equal. So if it's an 8-year-old or a 13-year-old, even though the 13-year-old is obviously like, chronically older, uh, their movement may not be as good as an 8-year-old too. So assessing everyone's movement quality and their ability, I think that's first and foremost before you add anything else to it. Um, and so I would encourage – like we keep saying I know it's – boring, but that the body weight stuff really matters and being able to control your body and space and own your space and own your body. And we call it like self-organizing. So if we're standing on one leg, can we self-organize to hold that balance and hold that position? Um, those things really matter no matter, you know, what the age is. Um, and so I think that you have to really look at the, the person's ability and their movement first. I think that body weight really does matter. And as they progress with that, adding some type of external load to it. Um, and then it just has to match the schedule. I know one part of the question was, um, like how much. Um, so sometimes it's, it's different for schedules. Um, and so I think like two to three days a week of some type of strength training is really beneficial um, on top of like the playing and practicing already. So I hope I hit all those parts of the question. That was great. Thank you for that. Um, I know that uh, Justine actually had a question as well. Uh, yeah. Justine? Yeah. Oh, Justine, if, oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, yes, question, like, more about like, what message would you like to give these girls? I mean, you, you're, you're a pioneer, you're incredibly strong, you have all this knowledge, you're hanging out with the guys all the time, and um, our girls are looking up to you. You know, what kind of message would you like to give them? That's a good question. I think about this a lot because I, I hope that this is a message we hang on to and I hang on to myself. Um, I've already shared my, my courage over comfort is a big part of me, but uh, another word that I really love that I hope you guys maybe will write down in a journal or on somewhere where you see it is the word grit, G-R-I-T. Uh, and the definition of grit means the sustained application of effort towards a long-term goal. And it's just a really long thing to say, sustained application, so constant applying yourself towards a long-term goal, towards something that you really, really want to do. And that means every single day doing something that'll get you to that goal. And so sometimes we get burnt out or we feel discouraged or we doubt ourselves. Uh, but I think if you could really kind of grow your grit, get better at grit, because it's um, something that you keep growing. It's not something that you just have or you don't have. You can really work on it. So days that it feels harder, I hope you rely on your grit and check yourself. But can you have sustained application, continuing doing something and giving that effort towards whatever that goal is that you're trying to achieve. That's what I want to do. So when I doubt myself, I check my grit. And where is my grit full or is it empty? And then how do I grow that grit? And that comes through, my opinion, a growth mindset, we call it, and thinking and, and relying on other people to help you continue to grow and not be stuck in your ways or not think that anybody could help you, but relying on people to help you and reach out to them. But I think if we can keep growing our grit as a bunch of girls and a bunch of women that are trying to to move and move forward. Uh, I think that that will set us apart. And that's why I want to be a part of that. That's why I work really hard because I want you guys to be right behind me doing the same thing. Um, and so keep growing your grit. Awesome. That's great advice, Andrea. Um, we are just about out of time. Is there anything else that you wanted to 
to mention to these girls or anything else you wanted to add as you kind of hear all the questions and you know see where everyone's coming from um any last kind of thoughts to wrap up yeah i think you guys have really great questions i can see you guys pondering and thinking and, and figuring out how you can apply this and i hope you do i hope you think about it some more um and i hope we maybe we can somehow I, I think to get the presentation uh, and i want to attach my, my contact information too if that's all right so if you have more questions that pop up or you need me to demonstrate something or, or show you something or talk you through it i'm always more than happy to do that so i want you to utilize me as a resource because uh, we need each other and we need to keep growing together. So um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I want to be a part of, of your journey and, and help you keep going. Yeah, for sure. If anybody has um, questions for her down the road, um, just feel free to email um, email me and then I can kind of connect you guys that way. Um, so we can kind of manage that a little bit. But yeah, if you guys have, um, I know you guys are all baseball players who are on this call and um, we're all working to get to be the best that we can possibly be at our game. So as you get to, um, you know, as you come across more strength and conditioning questions, as you get older, as you know, as you continue to develop, um, yeah, shoot them over and, you know, Andrea will very, very uh, graciously answer your questions. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you for everyone who joined us today, including I know some of the other folks from the twins also joined us today in support. <laughs> so thanks for everyone for joining. Um, and stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you again, Andrea, for joining us and for sharing everything. <laughs> thank you, guys. See you guys next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That's probably my favorite part of the call when everybody <laughs> just chimes in and writes thank you. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the call now. But thanks again, Andrea, for everything. Thanks. It was really really great and incredible. Um, and thanks for everybody for joining and for taking around. Um, okay. Well, we'll see you all soon. Thank <laughs> you. Bye, all.